when everybody's super, super bearish, go the other way. And when people are very emotional about their call, go the other way. I'd say the recession in Canada, sorry, Tef, it's already starting. Hello, and welcome to the Money Show Money Masters podcast. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief at Money Show, and this week, we're mixing things up a bit. I just got back from our 2023 Toronto conference, and it was an incredible event. Big crowds, great speakers, lots of interaction with attendees. But best of all, I had the chance to sit down with two of the smartest experts on Bay Street and Wall Street. We talked about the markets, Canadian and US economies, and the outlook for the rest of 2023 and beyond. And I have to say, their views could not be more divergent. That's why I'm so excited to bring you both of their interviews in this week's podcast episode. Let them lay out their cases, and you decide which is more compelling and how you can factor their guidance into your own investment portfolio. First up is David Rosenberg, founder and president of Rosenberg Research. Second is Brian Belsky, chief investment strategist of BMO Capital Markets. Let's get right to our talks from the exhibit hall floor in Toronto. David, how are you? Doing fine. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, you know, great show. I think a lot of people really tuned into what you had to say. Unlike some of the uh, keynotes, which were sort of this or that, either or, recession roadmap doesn't leave much room for interpretation. So what was your main message there uh, that, you, that you think people need this roadmap? I think that what's important is, um, you, you know, people like myself, we get uh, sort of pigeonholed into being bulls or being bears, you're bullish, you're bearish, or, or you're just plain wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, but that's just more about timing. What's really important about uh, to be value add uh, in my profession uh, is to focus on tail risk. Uh, And what are the things that people aren't talking about that we should be talking about? It is nobody good to go up on stage and talk about what is at the very center of the probability curve, to talk about what's already priced in, to talk about what's on the front page. Uh, of the newspapers. The most important thing is to identify if the consensus is wrong, which invariably it is, where are we going? Are we going to hyper growth, hyper inflation from the soft landing that we've been in? Or are we going to a recession and disinflation or deflation? What does the tail risk look like so that you can plan for that eventuality? Okay. You know, I was listening intently to what you had to say, and I think one of the things I took away was that you believe Canada is already in recession and the U.S. is almost on the threshold, right? Would that be accurate? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Canada is a more cyclical economy, uh, and we had less fiscal stimulus that lasted as long as it did in the United States in terms of those stimulus checks. Uh, and most Canadians see in the U.S., they were smart. Uh, 85% of their homeowners refinanced at the lows and locked in their mortgages. What did we do in Canada? It was basically throw caution to the wind and we just basically all went short on our mortgages, variable rate, uh, you know, take out, because of course, well, the central banks, they told us, yeah. rates are staying at zero to perpetuity. Oops, it's like, uh, it's like Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football. <laughs> and so what, what ha- is that Canada is much more exposed uh, in terms of household finances in particular to rising interest rates. And we just saw that, look, with the banks. So the banks did all this extend and pretend, you know, uh, with people that are really stressed out, you know, amortization and, you know, letting them, you know, essentially just borrow more money against their existing house. All these people are upside down on their mortgage. And you can see the banks are, uh, in Canada, are dramatically raising the loan loss provisioning. Uh, So that game, that game of letting these stressed out homeowners off the hook, I feel badly for them, but they made a very poor decision a couple of years ago to fund their mortgages short. Yeah. And now several hundred basis points later, okay, and we're talking about huge sums of money, which for most people, $100,000 of outstanding mortgages, your debt service is about to take a very big hit. And so I think that Canada, you're seeing it in the data too. Look, uh, what, second quarter GDP, negative 0.2. Bank Canada was plus 0.5, 1.5. You have Tef Mack, and the front page of the gold mail. Well, I, I, I don't think there's gonna be a recession. <laughs> you know, you were calling for 1.5, we got negative 0.2. You look at the monthly GDP numbers and you can see the momentum in the third quarter is still negative. So if the old rule of thumb, the old Bay Street, Wall Street colloquial is two quarters back to back negative real GDP, I'd say the recession in Canada, sorry Tiff, it's already starting. Got it. And, and it's interesting you brought up uh, Tiff's view of the world or, or the economy. I know he just recently gave a speech this week talking about how maybe policy is sufficiently restrictive. I think we see the inflation target. It, it's insight, I think, were his words. What do you think the 
policy outlook is for the Bank of Canada? What do you think is going to happen over the next 6 to 12 months, given your economic outlook? Here? I think that, uh, that the Bank of Canada, along with the Fed, but the bank first, will be singing like a canary. <laughs> okay, so I think that all this, this higher for longer, I mean, I get it every day. Higher for longer, higher for longer, higher for longer. So, so let me get this straight. The same group that told us about transitory is now talking higher for longer, but we're supposed to like buy, buy into that hook, line, and sinker. That's what I'm talking about. That is the consensus view, and the central banks want us to believe that. I think that we're ending in a recession, and I think that the inflation numbers in Canada are going to be coming down. They're going to be coming down globally. The amazing thing to me is that the most inflationary component of the CPI in Canada is this 5% chunk <laughs> called mortgage interest, which is up like 31% year and over I year why it's be up. because of the Bank of Canada. <laughs> so the Bank of Canada creates its own inflation <laughs> through mortgage. You strip out the mortgage interest component and inflation in Canada is running where? It's running like basically 2.4%. Good grief. Where was it running in January 2020? Where was this X mortgage interest CPI? For all the people there are all, hyperinflation, inflation, 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 the same metric, the same metric, the X mortgage interest CPI in Canada in January 2020, when the overnight weight was 2%, not 5 that number was 2.5% where it is today, unemployment rate, 5.5%. Where was it January 2020? 5.5%. Where's the overnight rate? 5%. Well, it was 2 back then. Why? So they are, and look, you can see it in the bank credit data. The, the bank credit data, it is slowing down precipitously. The money supply data, and, and they're both running negative in real terms. So, um, and you're taking a look at, you know, the Bank can is telling us where their estimates, now it's a wide range of where the, the neutral uh, Bank of Canada rate is, uh, and is hundreds of base points lower than where the 5% rate is right now. So unless they are true, unless they're true sad, sadists, right? Uh, they're going to be cutting rates. You know, just to get to neutral, they'd have to cut rates more than 200 basis points. Let alone if you get in a recession, they're going to have to go below neutral. So the worst thing, I guess, you know, what's the message? The message is fade the consensus. And the worst thing anybody can do right now is extrapolate into the future what the consensus narrative is right now and the central bank narrative. Uh, I would fade, I'm fading higher for longer. Like we, we should have faded, we should have faded transitory. We know that. So we should have faded transitory, fade higher for longer. Okay. And in terms of what that means for an investor, uh, I know you talked about essentially being long duration, being yeah. long uh, high qu credit quality bonds yeah. and government. Right? I, I, I would say 100%. So uh, I would limit, I mean, per personally, personally, my equity weighting is the lowest it's been since 2007. I think I have 15% of my, uh, but it won't stay there. Yeah. I'm just investing around the cycle. I'm investing around my assumptions and my forecasts. I don't want to have my head sliced off in recessionary bear market. By the way, if you haven't seen it yet, the Canadian market is down 9% from the highs. And that includes this nice little ref reflex rally we had in global equities. We're still in a fundamental bear market that hasn't fully priced in the recession that's just starting. I don't want to participate, okay? As I said at the conference, what was my baseball analogy? There's times to swing for the fences. That time is not now. There's time, there's a time to just be happy with walking into first base. So I know bonds are boring, but this is a period of capital preservation. And just be happy that you got the yield. You got the yield uh, and likely capital appreciation if those yields go down because of the convexity. So I think that in total return terms, Corporate bonds, high quality corporate bonds. I would be short duration corporate, long duration government, have that barbell. And I think you'll be happy with a mid single digit return in the next year. And you should be happy with that. That's walking to first base. Got it. Well, David, I really do appreciate you taking some time out to chat here. Uh, I know the audience was certainly paying uh, uh, rapt attention to what you had to say. Wow. So I'm guessing you're pretty bared up right about now after listening to David. But before you take any action in your investment or trading accounts, it's time to hear the other side of the story. I can assure you it's well worth a listen. I'm pleased to be speaking with Brian Belsky, Chief Investment Strategist at BMO. Brian, how are you? I'm great. 
How are you? I'm doing great. You know, I came out of your presentation earlier today, I, and I, I was joking. I just wanted to buy something, buy anything. It was a refreshing sort of change of pace, change of uh, tone to some of the presentations we've heard. I wonder if we can just start there from 36,000 feet up. Uh, what makes you bullish on this environment uh, for U.S. and Canadian markets? Well, I think it's a byproduct of a couple things. Um, very big picture, Mike. I think that the majority of investors and the investing public and the press and Whoever wants to analyze or talk about investments have become so macro and so quantitatively driven, looking at data points to, to feed their story. And that was a trend that worked last year. So congratulations. Uh, and I think what happens once you have some success with that, you just kind of double down. And I always like to remind people seven years out of 10, stocks are positive. So that's a pretty good that's a pretty good um, uh, percentage, number one. Number two, you have so many people kind of focus on the same thing. Recession, interest rates, inflation, and then because this whole notion of having a recession, Mike, is not happening, all they do is just push it out, push out their forecast. Oh, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. And so in the meantime, our job um, as setting the forecast for the U.S. market and the Canadian market for BMO and then talking about that forecast in terms of research product and running portfolios for our institutional clients around the world and for our private clients that we run real live money for both in Canada and the United States, we have to invest. We can't sit and wait around for when the, when, when the recession is supposedly coming. And so I just think investors um, and those people that are so focused on macro and quantitative, um, have, they're so afraid to be wrong, they don't want to be right. They'd rather play defense and say, oh, look at, I called the recession, or look at, I, the inflation did, did not go down. And that was the theme for last year. The theme for this year is, I believe, that we're heading more toward normalization because of what's occurred in this crazy marketplace really since COVID. And we need a period of normalization to kind of get our footing um, back to what it used to be. And I think that's where we're going. One thing that I found interesting, you mentioned your worldview and your approach to markets was shaped by meeting with Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch at the beginning of your career. How is that? Like, What are, what are their viewpoints and their approach to the markets influence what you do? Well, I was very blessed and fortunate. I was a young analyst in Los Angeles. I was 23 or 24 years old, and uh, the owner of the company really liked me because I was from the Midwest and I had kind of a work ethic uh, that some of the uh, some of the younger people in in California didn't. And he really took a liking to me. And because he had a very famous uh, brand, the owner of this the firm, they had a lot of dignitaries coming through, including Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch and Charles Schwab and presidents and things like this so I had 15 minutes with each um, Charles Schwab I'm sorry with um, Peter Lynch and Warren Buffett and it's amazing Mike they both told me the same thing uh, Brian never reach out uh, and buy something unless you can't touch it if you can touch it reach out and buy it and I've lived and died by that and the more simplistic and more common sense and the more relatable and understandable and what you're buying that is what you should believe in those are great words of wisdom, especially, you know, we have a lot of investors here at the show that are, are trying to get, uh, you know, more than stock tips, they're trying to shape their approach to markets. So I think that's why I wanted to touch on that briefly. Yeah. Um, if we shift it back to kind of what's going on in this, this current environment, you talked about three types of recession. There's three types, right? CapEx, consumer, and credit in general. And your opinion seems to be there is none of that or none of those three Cs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, to some degree, in, in the U.S. and Canadian marketplace, we haven't seen a lot of CapEx aside from enterprise spending, but now it's kind of more AI, okay? From the credit side of things, we talked about how everyone's worried that we're going to have a credit recession. Well, the banks are flush with cash, and they have the ability to make loans with respect to the consumer side and the corporate side. And it's where the smaller banks that may have bigger issues, but really the majority of loans are coming from the big banks in Canada and the United States anyway. On the consumption side, <laughs> we're still spending money on like drunken sailors. But then you can say, well, what about the debt levels and we're, we're spending our savings? But we're still employed, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's the key thing that I think a lot of the macro people are looking at. One data point that fits their story 
in terms of driving that into more of a negative side of things. Whereas, let's look at everything from a common sense perspective in the mosaic. And let's talk a little bit about the, the banking environment here in Canada and also in the U.S. I mean, you, you've referred to the U.S., you have a couple of the, the, these guys who crashed the keg party and screw things up in the yep. banking sector, but overall the banking sector is healthy, right? Very healthy. You know, I made the analogy too that sometimes as a parent you have to overcorrect. And so what the regulators have done in the United States that have obviously filtered through the Canadian banks is we overcorrected. We have excess regulations, enforced the level of cash um, and balance sheet strength to be like a fortress, especially compared to where it was, let's say, in 2008, 2009. And just in terms of business operations and loans and all that kind of stuff, the the quality of loans in the United States and Canada are pristine, especially relative to where they were, let's say, 20, 25 years ago. Anyway, I think that's lost because we like to throw out these bullet points. We like to throw out that fear factor that the banking crisis is, a cr or what happened in banks was the crisis because we're always fighting the last war. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. It also brings to mind sort of Fed policy and interest rates and how that factors in Fed in the U.S. and, and BOC here. Um, you actually said the Fed has done this perfectly, which is kind of different to the narrative you hear from a lot of other countries. Of course, because it's focused <laughs> on the negative. I mean, the Fed's always wrong. I mean, what the Fed did not do right is they were late, and we knew the Fed was going to be late. And then they kind of tinkered with their mandate a little bit. Remember, during COVID, they said they're going to focus on employment. They had a dual mandate, inflation and employment. And then they said, well, they've got to focus on employment to keep people employed. Then they circle back to more in, in, on the inflation side. We know this, right? It's a textbook. The, Fed's, the Fed was late. It was late. So then it accelerated. And the, new, the Fed knew it was late. And so I think the big thing that many people should be looking at in the Fed is we don't have a lot of dissension. If we start to see some dissension on the Fed in terms of the Fed governors thinking differently than Jay Powell, then maybe we'll have some volatility in the Fed. But I, I think we need to give the Fed credit and stop picking on. Don't kick the dog while it's down. <laughs> Got it. Okay. And let's assume, okay, that, that that's how things play out. I mean, are we going to be talking about interest rate cuts next year? Or are we going to be talking about a revival in rate-sensitive sectors like housing? I think we're going to see a revival in rate-sensitive uh, house, housing sector. Remember, the home builders of, in the United States have been this, one of the best-performing industries um, in 2023. A lot of people just think it's about tech, but home building's done very well, aside from the last uh, month or so with interest rates kind of ticking higher. But we don't think the likelihood of a cut, um, unless employment starts to unemployment starts to go up a little bit, the likelihood of a cut I think is low. If there's an interest rate cut, it's going to be later in the second half of the year. I and mean, there's many people who think we're going to cut in the fourth quarter, which I, I just don't I don't understand where that's going to come from. So we've obviously talked a little bit about financials, and you like that sector. Uh, again, some Canadian and U.S. banks. Um, what about things like tech? I mean, as we're we're talking here recently, everybody's focusing. Apple lost 190 billion dollars because of China. Blah blah blah. What are your thoughts on something like that? Well, this little company, this <laughs> Apple company, it's a it's a consumer staples company now, right? So Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Netflix, they're involved in your everyday life. They're like cereal and soda pop, okay? Then they have these other fringe companies uh, that have become massively strong like NVIDIA yeah. or Shopify here in Canada, right? Company specific and theme specific. So I think technology can, will, and should be an important part of your core portfolio for, th for the next 10 years because technology and AI especially is gonna be in every facet of the market, whether or not it's at Tim Hortons or Canadian Tire or even Kushtar or the banks, it's going to really set the theme going forward with respect to efficiency. All right, so financials, tech, anything else that, that you find even more attractive than the market in general? Well, I mean, I think in the United States, communication services is a really interesting sector because here in Canada, communication services is basically the telcos, where in the United States you have the streamers and uh, then you have also the telcos. So it's, it's more of a barbell. So Netflix and AT&T kind of fit kind of what we think about and communication services in the United States. But we also like materials in Canada. So we like the gold miners and we like some of the fertilizer companies and we like the forest product companies in Canada because after all, we're gonna make stuff here in North America and that's really the kind of the backbone of that. Any last messages here for investors or traders watching this? I mean, again, you, you know, whether you have a year-end target for this year or something you're looking at for next year. So our year-end targets for the U.S. are 45.50 for the S&P 500, but I think we're headed toward our bolt case scenario 50.50 for the TSX is 22,500. And I would say this: when everybody's super, super bearish, go the other way. And when people are very emotional about their call, go the other way. And I think 
you always be contrarian, Mike, if you have the analysis to back it up. And the analysis is this. North America has the best companies in the world. Best balance sheets, most consistent earnings, and they've weathered the storm through the storm of COVID that we never thought we'd get through. So I think that getting through that post-traumatic stress disorder is only going to position North American companies even better. Brian, thank you so much for your time here at the show. Thank you thank for you. watching. Hope you enjoyed the segment.